our next speaker on the stage, please. And uh, briefly, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Esuyo Mishida. She is uh, currently the Associate Senior Research uh, Fellow at the Institute of Developing Economies uh, in Japan. Um, her uh, background education is in uh, economies, and she's received uh, master degrees in economies from uh, Kobe University, and also master degree in economy in economics from the University of Western Ontario in Can in Canada. Uh, her uh, uh, PhD uh, in economics uh, she obtained from uh, Kobe University at the Graduate School of uh, International Corporation Studies, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mishida has um, uh, <coughs> uh, has, uh, int has uh, her interest is in the uh, uh, looking at the green growth in uh, Asia region, and uh, she has uh, work on various uh, projects in uh, examining the um, the impacts and the status of the uh, product related uh, environmental regulation on the company and firms in the uh, Asia. Uh, region and today her presentation will be on the green supply chain uh, management in the Asian countries. Please, Dr. Mishida. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for introduction and good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, um, my name is Ezio Michida from Institute of Developing Economies, Jetro. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, NASDAQ and MTEC for uh, inviting us to provide this uh, very nice opportunity to share our research result here. And um, let me see it here. So, um, I'm going to talk about the uh, green supply chain management in ASEAN. And then uh, that's the, the reason that we have been doing this research is that uh, we are, uh, our institute is a research institute based on the social science. And then uh, there are uh, 110 research fellows working on uh, social scientist, scientific issues in developing countries, including Asia, Latin America, and African countries. And then uh, the Asia is more and more important to Japan as uh, global, uh, globalization and economic integration in this area is progressed. Um, so uh, what I want to present here today is about our research project output. And then uh, our research project is uh, tripartite research collaboration between UNIDO. UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Organizations and area. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, this is kind of kind of new, uh, newly established international organization to making research in order to promote uh, economic integration in East Asian regions and our institutes. Uh, three of us are conducting collaborative research on green growth in Asia uh, for, from 2011 to 2014 for three, three years. And our, uh, our research project is aiming at making policy recommendations to ASEAN Secretariat. And my research work is part of this um, umbrella a big green growth in Asia project. And then the title is examining the impact of product related environmental regulations. I'm, uh, I'm using the uh, PRERs for abbreviations on Asian firms. And as uh, Dr. Ichikawa has already mentioned about the uh, ROHS from EU and uh, reach uh, chemical regulations from EU again. Uh, our, our research project is focusing on what kind of impact these regulations have on Asian regions. Because uh, uh, these kind of regulations are imposed or uh, started in different regions, 
But because of this uh, extensive supply chain around the globe, it is now affecting to the area beyond the uh, regulatory countries. So, and then we'd like to see the impact on Asian economies. Um, so, our approach is more like a bottom-up approach. Like, uh, there are some policies conducted in different regions and different countries. And then what we are aiming at to uh, grab a data or information from the ground, including uh, different economies in ASEAN and different industries and different types of farms, and then try to aggregate it and, and then we try to analyze what it is uh, happening on the ground to, in order to make a feedback to the policy arena. So that's uh, what we are trying to do. And <clears throat> our policy, uh, our research questions here in, in this project is, so, uh, well, uh, from the viewpoint of the companies, they know their own company supply chains, or they, they know their own suppliers. But overall, what is happening? Uh, what, how, uh, how much degree the different companies are affected by this kind of regulations? Well, there are some companies participating in global supply chains, but some others do not. So uh, in order to see from policy perspective, we need to grasp this overall pictures, not only for uh, certain types of companies, but uh, we, we try to uh, get the knowledge about the various farms from various industries about the impact. And then, uh, so uh, how do firms adopt PRER is the next question. Well, uh, probably, you know, uh, different companies or different lead firms uh, will make a different effort to adopt the PREL through green supply chain management. So um, we'd like to see uh, how it goes. And then uh, in order to make policy recommendations, what are the challenges for firms? Um, so this is uh, also important information t for us to find out the area where we can support the firms needing assistance from policy level. And then, again, relating to that, what types of firms need policy support? Well, probably bigger firms need a certain policy support, and uh, SMEs have different kind of supports. So uh, we, we need to find out uh, the areas of support needed uh, in different types of um, industries or companies. And then uh, what are the roles of uh, global or green supply chain to uh, adopt PRER? Uh, how, how much is it effective to construct a green supply chain? in order to adopt uh, various regulations. So uh, that are about our policy, uh, research questions. And in, in, in order to examine these questions, the, our research approach was to, uh, to get the data uh, from different countries, and then to get a, a relatively large firm survey and actually we conducted a, lot, a relatively large scale firm survey in Vietnam in 2011. And this year we did some survey in Penan, Malaysia, to show uh, the, uh, these, to, to address these questions. And we hope to get some of the, the characteristics of the different countries and industries from these data. And also, um, the large-scale survey is complemented by case studies. Then we can go in-depth studies through the case studies in different countries. <coughs> and for conducting this uh, research work, uh, we are collaborating with uh, different institutes and uh, members. So our members is, uh, I'm leading this team, and there are two other researchers uh, joining this research, research project from our institute. 
And then uh, three others uh, from uh, external professors from university. And uh, we are from economics uh, area. And also, uh, the, importantly, we are collaborating with the different organizations in Asia. The, first of all, the MTEC uh, from Thailand. And actually, we have give, uh, given a lot of support from Dr. Nuzarin uh, when we uh, constructed a questionnaire for Vietnam. Because she has a lot of knowledge about the firms in Thailand, and uh, she helped me to improve our questionnaire. And it, it helps us a lot. So thank you very much. Um, also, when we conducted a survey in Vietnam, we collaborated uh, with uh, VCCI. VCCI is the Vietnamese uh, Chamber of Commerce. And also, um, CIRIM Malaysia. And then also, I uh, get uh, a Malaysian government, the Penang government. And also, Jemai uh, from Japan in terms of uh, supply management uh, information in Japan. So uh, with these collaborations, uh, we have been conducting the research. And uh, part of our research output is already inputted in the ASEAN uh, levels. That's, for example, uh, we made a presentation on the 17th meeting of AMEC, AEM METI Economic and Industrial Cooperation Committee. And there is a working group on chemical industries. And then uh, last year, we, we made a presentation there to, to disseminate our research output. So um, about the topic, <coughs> uh, I'd like to introduce about this um, in environmental regulations and standards. Uh, so product-related environmental regulations, which is our topic on this research uh, uh, team. This is uh, imposing requirements on product characteristics in order to protect human health and the environment at consumption disposal site. And so, uh, as Dr. Itsukawa has already mentioned, this is not the usual or conventional environmental regulation, which is imposed the regulations on the production site, like factory site or production site, but it is imposing regulations on the final product. So this is where the green supply chain management uh, is required. It's that the needs of the green supply chain management is needed. Um, uh, well, in order to comply with the final product, you have to go and check all the suppliers and component makers to comply with the regulations. So this is uh, completely different types of regulations uh, compared to the conventional production side environmental regulations. And then life cycle management through green supply chain is more important now. And uh, also, uh, with similarly affecting the firms, uh, there are um, international standards. And I was very happy to hear that there are lots of efforts going on in the international standards arena, ISO, IEC. And then this also affecting a various, uh, affecting or the, the firms are really benefiting from the various international standards. And then there is also another kind of standards, which is not international standards, but there are also uh, private standards, and certificates, and requirements. And actually, uh, when we start looking at the impact of uh, PRER on different firms, at the firm level, they may not be aware that if they are asked about to comply certain regulations, but actually, uh, it is coming through the interpretations of various types of private standards or the, um, their customers' green procurement manuals. So their green pro procurement manuals already interpreted the, the EU regulations or other countries' regulations. So uh, once the companies comply with that private requirements, then it leads them to comply with the various countries' mandatory 
product related regulations. So uh, in order to know the impact, we also need to look at the private standard aspect as well. So that's where uh, we, are, we, are, we are putting this uh, private standards item here. And for, so uh, what kind of private standards are there in the world? Uh, there are uh, different standards, private standards in different sectors. For example, food products. It's, um, the, the EU has a global gap um, system, and the BRC is uh, British Retailer Councils from UK. And in terms of textile industries, uh, there are Ecotex, or Global Organic Textile Standards. And for forest products, uh, there are FSC uh, certification, it's a Forestry Stewardship Council. So there are more and more um, private standards are coming in to the arena. And then uh, the one of the reasons behind the increase of the private standards is that, um, for example, this is mainly coming from European regions, but uh, for example, for food sectors, there are a big um, supermarket chains and for them, in order to compete with each other, they have to do differentiation in products. So in order to make differentiation, they will create their own private standards, and then uh, they were asking their suppliers to comply or the meeting the standards. So, uh, the, uh, well, I will eventually uh, talk about this, uh, the necessity of the harmonization of or coordination of various standards, but actually on the lead farm side, they, have, they are doing this for their business need. So there are two different aspects for this uh, advent of private standards. And besides these uh, certification of private standards, there are also uh, firms on requirements, like, um, um, like IKEA is a really famous uh, procurement manuals or the supplier's manual called iWay. And for other companies as well, even though they, na they don't name it, but they have uh, green, global green procurement manuals by, for example, in electric electronics companies around Grove. So, um, and the number of these kind of requirements, both mandatory and voluntary, are increasing. So, <clears throat> so mandatory, with regard to the mandatory re uh, regulations, PREOs, there are various types. So this is, uh, here is examples of PREERs, and it's not at all the exhaustive list. And this is only the part of it, but um, it, these are mainly developed from EU, like end of life vehicle um, regulations, WE, W-E-E-E, -E, and ROHS, and REACH uh, for chemical regulations. And then uh, regulations on automobile exhaust gas and rules on exhaust for greenhouse gases and ERP, energy related product um, directives. And from US, CAFE and China. China has already introduced the China ROAHS. So the number of these uh, regulations are increasing and that means the, the it these requires all the suppliers to comply with it in order to keep ex exporting to these markets. So um, actually uh, we go to this one first because now, uh, well, at first it seems these regulations are only uh, asked by uh, big developed market, but it's not the case. Uh, like uh, ROHS, like regulations, are now spreading across the globe. And for example, uh, EU has introduced uh, laws and directive in 2006, and later on, Japan got uh, GIS. This is not mandatory one, 
but this is labeling or the, the uh, industrial standard code. But Japan has introduced a similar one. And California, USA introduced a similar one. And China, then South Korea, Norway, and Thailand. Thailand is also uh, um, the, the industry uh, standard. And Turkey, and again, California, India, and Vietnam. So an increasing number of countries have started adopting the similar regulations uh, imposed by EU or other developed countries. The reason for that is that, well, EU or USA or Japan are a really large ex um, market for many exporters. And in order for policymakers in different countries to help their own firms to comply with these destination market requirements, it is probably best for them to develop the similar one, a counterpart one, in their own countries so that it can disseminate further within the country. So because of this uh, special characteristics of this uh, PREL, more and more countries are I started introducing these kind of regulations. And the other reason for some countries uh, introduce this kind of uh, rules-like regulations is to try to prevent the inflow of less regulated products. So there are sometimes fear that uh, some of the products, uh, the highly regulated one, or are just exported to the, the big market, but for other not compliant one, could be flowing to their country. So I think mainly the two reasons uh, many countries have uh, introduced these similar regulations or voluntary uh, scheme. So, uh, so it, uh, with that background, uh, our research is going to focus on the, well, PREI is, covers uh, various types, but uh, it's better for us to focus on a specific aspect. So we pick up the chemical regulations as an uh, example of PREL. So as already uh, introduced before, uh, mainly we are targeting to uh, examine the EU rules regulation, Restrictions of Hazardous Substances Directive. Uh, 2006, it was introduced and it's required to be enforced and to become law in each member state of EU. And this directive restricts the use of six hazardous materials, lead, mercury, cadmium, hexapalant, uh, chromium, PBB, PBDE, in manufacture of various types of electronic and electrical equipment. And EU REACH, REACH is a registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals. Uh, it's uh, entered force in 2007. And then this uh, regulation addresses the production and use of chemical substances and their potential impacts on both human health and the environment. So REACH require all companies manufacturing or importing chemical substances in, in, into European Union, more than one ton eventually. It's not yet, but it's, it's, it's gonna be strengthen, uh, strengthened in the future. And the REACH also applies for the chemicals in product, where they, they call it articles. And so that's where the, all the different types of manufacturers, including garment industries, uh, and the, the EE product, it, uh, suppliers of these industries are also affected. So this is not only about chemical industry, but it's all manufacturers need to comply. So, and when we look at the, the economic situation in Asia, uh, supply chains of manufacturing sectors are really extensive in this region, and then the vertical and the horizontal integration is really progressed. So uh, then green supply chain management comes in, and we have to manage this really complex system in Asia. At uh, each production stage, uh, the, if you want to fully compliant with these regulations, compliance is needed at every stage of uh, the supply chains. And so, so, that, so for example, country A, there is a design. 
and then come to BC, uh, procuring raw materials, purchasing raw materials, and it's transported to another country, say CDE, and they are doing manufacturing. And then finally, those components, parts, manufactured in different countries, move to country F to assemble. And the final goods will be exporting to final markets. It could be one, but it could be a different market. So the, the, the challenge for this supply chain management is that not all firms are realizing that the final destination of their component product is, is, is going. So uh, direct exporter may know the, 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 their exporting market, but there, there are many uh, indirect exporters so even though uh, the firms that are not directly exporting, they, they need to be fully aware of the regulations and requirements overseas. So, um, so PRERs characteristic, characteristics can be summarized like um, PRERs, now increase in number and variation around the world and also, uh, uh, many revisions are made to PRERs. For example, REEDS, is, uh, they, they have a long list of uh, chemicals regulated, but the, the, the list is revised really quick, frequently. So one time the company has met the regulations, but th that's not the end of the story. You have to keep working on it constantly. That's another challenge. And then these regulations required through uh, private standards as well. So it's, it's, it's uh, the complex situation. And in terms of lead firms, uh, they need to do a uh, life cycle management. And then they have to choose suppliers by taking into account environmental management capacity in addition to quality and price offered. Well, there are more aspects that company has taken in, but uh, well, in the past, a long time ago, environmental management capacity was not a criteria when the lead firm is picking up their suppliers. But now, this is a really important criteria, one of the criteria for them to choose the suppliers. So for lead firms, and this is a challenge. And for suppliers, as I said, um, maybe direct exporters, indirect exporters, and they may not aware if their product is in the final product going to European market, but still they have to do. And uh, from a, um, the industry, industry structure uh, perspective, the usually the, the, for the supply chains, the upstream the supply chains and downstream the supply chains, the number of firms are relatively small. But for the midstream of the supply chains, there are a large number of firms participating, and also SMEs are also participating in the uh, midstream. And how to manage this uh, very thick um, 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 companies, including SMEs, is really important, it's a big challenge and the key to have a very uh, proper green supply chain management. So um, going back to the research questions, uh, it's uh, related to the chemical PRER. How are firms affected by chemical PRER? And are structures of supply chains affected by PRER? So if the PRER is affecting uh, Asian firms, we expect that this is affecting the competitive, um, uh, the, the environment of competition, and it also affect the structures of supply chain. Some suppliers win and some other suppliers lose. So this will affect the structure of industries as well. And then how do a firm adopt PRERs? And what are the factors that help firms to adopt PRERs? So with these questions in mind, uh, we conducted this Vietnam firm survey. 
uh, conducted from 2011, November to 2012, January, with the support of VCCI in Vietnam. And our data set spans all provinces in Vietnam. And then we pick up industries that are, can be affected by chemical PRERs. And we sent out survey sheets to 12,000 firms in Vietnam and collected uh, 1,055 firms information. So this is quite a good response rate. So eight, some 8% eight or eight, 9%. So uh, our sample is, is this uh, Vietnam 1,055 firms. So, um, well, this is in Thailand, and then not many people are interested in the Vietnam situations, but I hope the uh, similar challenge can be expected in Thailand. I'm sure that Thailand is much more heading in terms of adopting various regulations, but uh, I, I think we can learn something from other countries as well. And then you may have some suppliers in Vietnam, so probably for these results can benefit in that perspective, in, in that point. So uh, our sample, among our sample, and domestic firms, 54%, state-owned enterprises, 4%, and FDI companies are 31%. And uh, reflecting the Vietnamese uh, industrial structure, uh, top five industries in our data set samples is wearing apparel is the top 284, and then wood product, food processing, rubber, and finally electrical equipment. equipment. So I think compared to the Thailand supply chain management, electric equipment share is lower in Vietnam. And then we asked about uh, where they procure input materials and where they are exporting to. And then they say that uh, the input materials procured from China, a domestic Vietnam do um, market, and South Korea, Taiwan, and others. And on contrary, the uh, export firms, the 74% of export firms say that their top destination markets is EU, US, and Japan. So it's really clear that uh, what you have to do the, in terms of green supply chain management is the, the importance of Asian vision in order to export to the developed countries. Um, and then we asked about um, part, if your firm is participating in global supply chains, and then yes is 28% uh, and uh, no is 72% among 755 answers. So uh, for Vietnam, not, uh, I mean, uh, relatively smaller shared companies recognize that uh, they are participating in global supply chains and the remainings really are not attaching to the global supply chains. So we will see what's the difference between those firms uh, participating in the chains and those do not. So, um, so results from Vietnam firm survey. One, how are firms affected by chemical PREs and private standards? So uh, at first we did not know how much it has an impact. It's in Vietnam and then uh, it's, it, it could be very small um, impact on the Vietnam companies. So we'd like to see from this uh, relatively large data set the scale of the impact. So uh, how many firms have been re received requests about chemicals in product? Answer, 43% firms have received some requests about chemical substances in products by customers. So it's about half companies has been requested. And then how many firms have experienced rejection of products by customers? It's, it's a bit uh, not, I mean, good question to ask, but do we like to see it's a real impact on the firm level? And then 10% of firms have experienced rejection by customers due to chemical substances in product. This means there is a regulations and then at the end, uh, they, 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 are, they are going to be rejected at the ports 
or import parts of the destination market. But actually, uh, before reaching to the final market, they are already rejected by their customers between the supply chains. So um, this is uh, where the supply chain management is important for the farm levels. And then um, how farms are affected by chemical PREs. For farms that comply with PREs, what was the motivation, we asked. And then, and with relating to this question, we asked who requested to take measures on chemicals in product, and then customers. The answers is uh, the most in number. 262 firms said the customers requested, and then suppliers as well, and then government. So again, uh, this customer-supplier relationship is important for them to receive the request or address the needs of the chemical substance management. And then uh, second question relating to this is what are the reasons of that firms adopt PREOs? And among 30, uh, 337 answers, uh, 139 firms said uh, in order to avoid customers' buyers' rejection. And 84 firms comply with domestic regulations, uh, 40 firms to increase export, 20 firms to improve brand image, 18 firms said uh, to keep current transactions. So uh, it shows that uh, many firms really um, feel pressured to do something in order to keep transactions with uh, current customers or suppliers. And so the next result is uh, related to the question about our structures of supply chains affected by PREOs. The smaller question for this is, have firms changed materials inputs to, due to requirements of chemicals? Among 406 firms, 29% answers changed. So actually they changed, 29% uh, in Vietnam case changed their suppliers. So that they, they, they may be suppliers, they, they have to change uh, the suppliers. And then, um, the, another small question is, do firms use different chemical substances depending on destination markets? Actually, that this, the figure is a bit surprising to us, but 51% uh, of firms says that they change chemicals depending on the market. So actually, there are firms uh, exporting to two different types of market. One is highly regulated one. The other one is loosely regulated one. Uh, so actually, that according to the destination market, they change the chemicals in order to optimize the price or the procurement. So this is where the, the many policymakers in ASEAN regions uh, worry about this inflow of unregulated things, uh, products into their countries. So I think it's a legitimate worry. And then uh, do firms change destination markets to, due to PREs? Uh, some firms changed, but only 4%. So usually when you are already exporting to the highly regulated market, they can adopt the PREs. So, but uh, still, this result indicates that the PREs is creating a possibility of a structural change in supply chains uh, when they, they, they have to comply, uh, they have to make compliance in terms of both destination market and then procurement market. And then question three, how do firms adopt PREs? The smaller question for this is, what did firms do to adopt PREs? The answer is, the most uh, large number of answers is, first, sending out products for testing, second, production process change, Third, investment in new production, equipment, facility, or plant. And four, changing inputs. So, um, well, first, first thing it seems that the companies have to do is testing. And then this uh, complexity of uh, different countries have different testing environment is, is uh, the, the issue that comes in. So I think that's where the, uh, the international standards needed. And then uh, the next smaller question 
is after adopting PREOs, how did cost and price change? Did export increase after complying with the PREOs? Then uh, did cost increase when taking measures? Among 40, uh, 422 answers, the 253 firms say increase, 144 unchanged, decrease uh, is only for 25%. And then after the cost increase, how much the price change? Then 223 said increase, 184 unchanged, eight decrease. So, um, so there, there are some companies who can um, make a price increase, and then but other companies just uh, offering the same price. And then did export change after meeting PREs? 66% of firms said no change, and 53 decrease, and 42 increase. So it seems there is a pros and cons on complying with PREs too. Um, well, in order to keep exporting, it, it shows that the PREL compliance is a must. But once uh, you comply with PREL, the, the cost increase and the, you may lose some competitiveness. So the many companies try to find out the best solution among these um, pros and cons and cost and benefits. So, um, so I think that there are uh, many remaining results, but I think I have already addressed uh, many results. So um, I think lessons for policy I, I'd like to just mention for this one, because now uh, as I showed, uh, the rules regulations are implemented, are started in, implemented in different regions in Asia. Actually, um, it can create a TBT among Asian regions. Well, in terms of product standards, uh, it also hampered the trade, smooth trade flow. But also, the same story applies to the regulations in different countries. So when every country is start to introduce uh, different types of regulations in chemicals in products, then uh, one company wants to sell the product in different markets, but they have to put the different labels and different testing and so on. And then uh, with regard to the, the global supply chains, although this global supply chain extended uh, overall, um, that kind of regulatory uh, introduction is uh, really hampering the trade flow in these regions. So uh, what we made a policy recommendations to uh, ASEAN Secretariat is how we can coordinate or harmonize the policy level efforts to help firms, especially SME firms, because it's really hard for SMEs to know various regulatory information from all over the world. So I think that's an important aspect for policy making. So thank you very much. We, we have um, uh, other um, research output put on our website, so please visit. Okay, thank you very much.